This is where we are as a nation. We need revelation. We need repentance. God, would you speak and would you break up my heart that I might say yes, Lord, and say I disagree, you're right, that's wrong, and I'm coming back to you. So what happens to a Christian nation that forgets? The erosion of the foundation, the the bondage instead of freedom, and number three, there's a loss of security for our children and their children. And this is where some of you are like, okay, now I'm paying attention because I love my kids. I love my grandkids. Remember the outworking of Nietzsche's view that God is dead. It's the loss of absolute basis for morality, which leads to nihilism, which argues that life is without objective meaning, purpose, or intrinsic value. 2 Kings 2.16. Look at the way this guy's children and future children suffered. And he burned his son as an offering. This guy's wicked. He burned his son as an offering. And used fortune telling and omens and dealt with mediums and with necromancers. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. He's so evil, he offers his own son in a fire. See, if there's no moral foundation on which to stand, then the intrinsic value of every life is lost. And here's the irony in our culture those who want equality for each person want it without a creator. And they don't realize that Nietzsche was the most significant proponent of the super race. And he discipled Hitler. And Hitler personally went to Mussolini and Stalin and shared Nietzsche's thoughts. Right? He, 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 Hitler's reading Nietzsche. He's like, oh, okay, great. So he's proposing this, pr- proposing this super race, right? And then Hitler gets a hold of that. And look at what he does with it. All of this starts in the university classroom. Nietzsche proclaims the 19th century, that in the 19th century, when everyone realized God was dead, the 20th century would be the bloodiest century. And that is exactly what happened. From the great wars of the 20th century to the legalization of abortion, society's acceptance of assisted suicide and euthanasia, persecution of Christians across the globe and of Jews, the intrinsic value of every life was lost. Now y'all are like, hey, I'm glad I came to church today. I was looking for a little inspiration, man. It's been a hard week. Stay with me. Here's the deal. We need a declaration of dependence. We need a declaration of dependence, right? Let me show you the power of one, right? We've seen the power of one to lead astray. Let me show you the power of the one to lead to life. His name is Josiah. He's Manasseh's grandson. He takes the throne as an eight-year-old. Eighteen years into his reign... The book of the law is found in the temple. Now notice what happened. 2 Kings 22, 8 through 11. And Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the secretary, I found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan and he read it. And Shaphan the secretary came to the king and reported to the king, your servants have emptied out the money that was found in the house of the Lord and was delivered it into the, has delivered it into the hand of the workmen who have oversight of the house of the Lord. Then Shaphan the secretary told the king, Hilkiah the priest gave me a book and Shaphan read it before the king. And when the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. What happened? They have so moved away from the word of the Lord, they didn't have any more copies of it. Here's what happens. The pastor shows up at the church one day, and he's cleaning out a closet, and he finds a book called Holy Bible. And he's like, hmm, I wonder what this is. This is how far the high priest is away from what God had called him to. And he starts opening. He's like, well, look at this. I bet you the king would be interested in this. (laughs) So he sends it through the king's, you know, chief of staff, like, hey, look what I found. It's actually pretty good. And what happens? They read it to the king, and he tore his clothes. What takes place? The revelation of God and the repentance of hearts. When the word of God is proclaimed, see, the word of God has the power to break up the heart. It has the power to smash up rocks. And here's the deal. Our hearts are hard. And they need the word to, boom, smash it up. And and, and they read read the word of the Lord to the king, and it broke his heart. And he repented. And he said, we're going to gather everybody, and we're going to do something. 
Notice what happens. We're almost done. 2 Kings 23, 1 and following. Then the king sent, and all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem were gathered to him. And the king went up to the house of the Lord, and with him all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the priests and the prophets, all the people, both small and great. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this place, in this book. And all the people joined in the covenant. So you have revelation you have repentance and then what do you see you see worship and commitment and I would just say that's where we are this is where we are as a nation we need revelation we need repentance we need worship and commitment and as I don't even know who said it in, in the book of, in the word of the Lord but it says may judgment start in the house of God we, we shouldn't expect the world to do we should do this God, would you speak and would you break up my heart that I might say, yes, Lord, and say, I disagree. You're right. That's wrong. And I'm coming back to you. In, in, in our study of Revelation, again, we'll pick it up next week. But of the seven churches, five, Jesus says, here's my problem with you. And he calls each of them to repent. Repent. Listen, repentance isn't one a thing you do once in your Christian life. Repentance is something I'm doing on a weekly basis, if not a daily basis. I am agreeing with God, you're right, Lord, that was wrong, and I'm turning. And if you haven't repented in a long time, you're missing out on the grace of God washing over you. And that might be why there, there's a little hardness of heart and a little, you know, you're a little cynical about things and, and because you, you, haven't, you haven't agreed with God about some things that he's telling you you need to fix. This is wrong, turn this way, come with me and I got you. Revelation, repentance, worship, commitment. This is what we need today. It's what our nation needs today. It's what our children's children need today. Our children's children need to see parents and grandparents saying, you know what, I'm wrong and I'm turning this way and I'm going this direction. And may it start with me. And may it start with you. The power of one to change a community, the power of one to change a family, the power of one to change a nation there were still consequences. The days ahead were difficult. But this is what God used. He used a leader. So pray with me that God would give us leadership. God would give us leadership. And trust God, because he's sovereign, sovereign over the nations, that whatever leader is given, it may not be the one you want. He's still on his throne. And he's working out over time how he wants to bring hearts to him.